Hey, I'm Jesse, and this is our final devotion in Nehemiah. We're in Nehemiah chapter 13. We've seen Nehemiah ask for you know, uh, ask for God to remember him as he has addressed three different issues throughout Jerusalem post the rebuilding campaign success. He sees it begin to degrade in its adherence to holiness, and I believe that he goes too far. He becomes sort of pharisaical before the Pharisees even existed. Uh, in some of the ways that he would address these things. But here's the bottom line, here's the final, the, the, the final two verses of the book of Nehemiah. So I purified them from everything foreign and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. Now, these last two prayers, I think, are more are arguably more acceptable than the first of the four in this final chapter in which he's asking God just to remember him with favor. Uh, that's something that we see David write in the Psalms. I think that's a, that's a good thing to pray for. God, would you show us favor in this? Would you pour out your favor upon this? And so he's purified them from everything foreign. That's in verse 30 in the opening of it. But again, what has been missing from Nehemiah is that ever so important precedent of Ruth the Moabitess who disavowed her faithfulness to Chemosh and professed that she would worship Yahweh. If there were worship of foreign gods still now pervading in Jerusalem, I can see how that's something where you do need to kick them out. But it's possible that Nehemiah kicked women out and families out who were faithful to Yahweh. Now, in the end, he does kick out idolatry worship and his intentions are not racist, they're not nationalist. His intentions are to be faithful to Deuteronomy 23. That's what he's trying to live out. But he assigns duties to each of the priests and Levites and he arranges for the donations of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. So he's, he's now reestablished some of the systems and processes by which Old Testament worship would remain in the city of Jerusalem. This is the second time he's done this, right? Because the whole story begins in chapter one with him asking King Artaxerxes uh, for what he needs to go start this campaign. Then he inspects everything and he delegates it out and everything gets rebuilt. And then he puts the systems and processes in place. Zerubbabel has rebuilt the temple. Ezra has also kind of led the way and they've observed these festivals. And now he's appointed these roles and duties to the Levites and priests and everything's good. But then what happens after that is that things begin to degrade. And so now he's come back in and it's sort of like a re-revival at the very end. It's not perfect though. Because again, I, just, I believe, like many Bible scholars do, that Nehemiah goes too far. It becomes, becomes overly legalistic in some of his enforcement of it. Not to the point that, uh, say, guys like the Bible Project, I love their work, but I disagree with them on this. I think that it was right of, of Nehemiah, it was right of Nehemiah to do some kicking out. Okay, there was some, some kicking out to be done, like Eliashib, he needed to be kicked out. Tobiah, he needed to be kicked out. Okay, there's a standard somewhere. Being being stringent about the Sabbath, he's absolutely right about that. But in the end, it's sort of like a re-revival. And this story of Nehemiah, it was ruin at first. There was rubble, scorched rubble. And now at the end of Nehemiah, there's a rebuilt wall around this temple and there's a reestablished uh, worship among God's people. It compromised and it swayed and then the Sabbath was compromised, but now there's a re-revival at the very, very end. Such is the nature of the people of God in the Old Testament and oftentimes in the New as well. When we looked at earlier chapters of Nehemiah, we see this huge prayer that recounts the full history of Israel. How this is what Israel's been doing for millennia how they would be faithful to God and then they would kind of compromise. And they're faithful to Yahweh and then they would kind of slip away. And they're faithful to God and then they would drift away. And in just that one prayer alone, I, I, took, the, I took my Bible and I kind of shaded out the times where uh, everything was looking really great and then they would sort of compromise and slip farther away from God. And everything was looking great and then they would compromise and like slip further away from God. So the parts that were sort of shaded are the parts where uh, they'd slipped away from God. So even the very end of the last two verses of this book, there it, it, you have this re revival after a slipping away following a mass reconstruction. Does that describe your relationship with God? If so, let's go before him and let's, let's, let's talk to him honestly about this. Is it an immaturity on your part? 
Is it that you lack discipline? Is it that you still let sin live in your life? Let's talk to him about it. God, I pray on behalf of those who feel like Israel looks like their heart toward you as they repeatedly have made these proclamations of faith, but then they just slip away. And then they'll have this emotional experience, but then they just fall away. God, I pray that my friends would confess Jesus as Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is not a decision made out of emotion. It is a drawing of your Holy Spirit on their hearts to bring them home. That it is not a rededication. It is at last salvation. Because you are Lord, you're in control, you're the boss, we surrender absolutely everything to you and we repent from our sins. Should we slip away again into sin, we will repent once more, all the while maintaining Jesus as Lord. And should we sin now again, we'll do so in direct pushback against your Holy Spirit's present conviction in our hearts. So Lord, I lift up my friend who feels like he's been wishy-washy and on the sidelines, sometimes saved and sometimes not. God, would you save my friend once and for all and actually save him, actually save her? Would your Holy Spirit come down and bring conviction for sin, repentance from sin, that we'd bear fruit that is consistent with repentance and live a life worthy of our calling? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll see you in the next book, my friend.